spaces. For W. All right, so um, how do you uh, how do you prove this? Well, proof. Let beta prime be a basis for W. We know we can find those by the dimension theorem, as we talked about earlier. In other words, literally independent generating set. Running the Gram Schmidt algorithm to obtain beta and as the Gram-Schmidt algorithm maintains the span, um, you know, the Gram-Schmidt algorithm uh, implies the span of beta span of beta prime, and beta is orthonormal. So we can always find an orthonormal basis for a subspace of our end. We just run a branch bit on it, and there you go. It's pretty nice. Now, last time I defined for you guys the projection, right, under the subspace. So what was the projection under the subspace? Yeah. The non vector term was the vector with the non wanted so it's cracked out. Okay, so we're given orthonormal basis beta, let's say equals to C one V K W. A subspace of our end. Now, you see that there's no loss of generality there, right? That's not saying anything special about the subspace. Any subspace permits an orthonormal basis, right? In fact, it permits lots of them. That's kind of a problem. So, the projection onto W, I, I told you, we could define as this. J equals 1 to K. We take the inner product, which for us is the dot product, but um, I'll talk a little bit more about inner products today as we go on. And that was the formula for the projection, right? And on the flip side, you know, so for us, I mean, just to be clear about it, but that really is, it is X transpose times BJ times, uh, well, times Vj. If you want a formula for it in terms of matrix multiplication alone. But, and then what was your? Your orthogonal projection onto W? Little lower piece W is little lower piece V. Because you can't wait. Oh, wait, no, no. So your orthogonal projection was just x minus the projection, right? And it's essentially a tautology that x is equal to what? Uh, the projection of wx plus the fourth wx. Right. Now, logically speaking, there, there's kind of a little bit of a problem here if you think about it. Um, which orthonormal basis, right? If you think about it geometrically for just a minute, <coughs> Think about the plane, right? Think about the vector off the plane. You know, think about the shadow of that vector onto the plane, which is the projection, right? Geometrically thinking about it. So this point up here is x. This is the origin. So we could we could build the projection. We make the projection red here. And I'll make it uh, the black. Here's the projection right there. So you can make the projection 
like that, right? Now you can build the projection a lot of different ways. Maybe you can build it like this. So to speak, right? That might be with respect to basis beta equal to B1, B2, right? But you could perhaps choose a different basis, right? There could be a different basis. You could choose another normal basis for W, like maybe this one. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, How about this one? I'll make it dotted. how we can figure out how they're related. Let me show you. So <clears throat> if, um, if B1 dot um, B2, well, I want to I be a little more general here. I'm going to draw a picture for two, but I'd like to give you an argument for K. So let's suppose, <clears throat> suppose that um, beta equals to B1 BK and gamma equals to W1 WK are orthonormal bases for um, for W, right? You can extend those. Right. You can of course extend those to like beta tilde. get a linearly independent set by adjoining vectors to beta and to gamma, respectively. And then once I'm done with that, I run a bit against the door to normalize. All right. So here's the interesting thing. You can argue, right, that if beta tilde, for example, is d1 dot 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 bn, we have vi dot bj equal to the Kronecker delta ij, or if you like, in the product of the i and vj, Kronecker delta ij, so I'm mostly working with that product though, so. <clears throat> now what that says about the basis matrix is what? Well, I'll tell you. The basis matrix beta transpose times beta. If I look at the ij element of that, um, oh, it's the wrong thing to say. No, it doesn't do it. So what is the IJ element of that? <coughs> Row I um, beta transpose um, dot product with what? I mean, technically it's this times the J column, right? But what is the i pro of beta transpose? That's exactly vi dot vj, so we get Kronecker delta ij. Therefore what? Therefore beta transpose beta is equal to the identity matrix. In other words, if you have an orthonormal basis, the basis matrix is orthogonal. It's an orthogonal matrix that satisfies the condition matrix transpose times matrix equals identity. The same is true for gamma.
so we find that the um, basis, beta basis matrix and the gamma basis matrix, they're both elements of what's called ON. ON being the set of R in RN by N, such that R transpose R is equal to the identity. Now, I think you're asked to show that that forms a group in your homework. Yes? Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is beta bar an orthonormal basis? Yes. OK. <clears throat> so, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should be, I should be all, I'm missing some tildes over here, but. <coughs> <coughs> I mean, I've got an option here. I could work with OK, OK? But then I'd have to do something like find some sort of silly uh, coordinate map from Rn to Rk to identify the W as, as a copy of Rk sitting inside Rn. And I'm just choosing work in Rn instead. I'm not sure which is less clumsy. But anyway, I, I do have that these are OM matrices. And so, you know, I can relate. I can relate one to the other, right? One thing I can do is I can look at gamma tilde, right? Well, gamma tilde, what's that equal to? Well, if you use your imagination, if you tilt your head and squint, you can see that that's really just equal to, well, what is it equal to? It's equal to, it's equal to beta tilde times beta tilde inverse um, times gamma tilde. All right. But this matrix here, you can call it R, right? And you can show that R is an element of ON again. You can prove that the transpose of that matrix, well, first of all, it's, it's, it's you know, because, because beta tilde is orthogonal, we already know that beta tilde, in, beta tilde inverse is just beta transpose. <coughs> so beta transpose times gamma tilde is actually equal to R. So you can show that R transpose R is equal to the identity. That's a short exercise. It's not hard to do. And when, once you do that, <coughs> what you have is that these two orthonormal bases, right, the two different orthonormal bases for your subspace, they're related by a rotation, or, or possibly an inversion. The determinant of, of the matrix R could be plus or minus one. Like, it doesn't have to be a counterclockwise. It could be, you know, the order of the basis could be flipped over or something. But <coughs> anyway, my point here is simply this, is that that then implies that um, you can write, basically you can, you can, you can write the gamma matrix as equal to the, the beta matrix times some R. Where R is a rotation. Make sure that makes sense just a second here. So this would be what? This K thing? So this is what? N rho. So this is N by K. This is, oh man. Sting. I guess I need to do something else. Uh, I'm missing some fine print here, guys. So I got to keep the tilde's on here. I think my, my choice of Rn was a bad choice. I guess I can't avoid the difficulty. What I really should do is identify W with Rk and then work with OK. Find a rotation in OK, which would be, like for this, it would be O2, a two-dimensional rotation matrix. 
and then that will relate gamma. And through essentially the same argument, you can relate gamma and beta by a little uh, rotation in, 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 in k dimensions. All uh, right, so. And so, <clears throat> so my, my point was just this, guys. The projection on the w of x was equal to, well, if you write it out, and again, I, my, my argument here is, is slightly wrong, uh, but I'm going to give it anyway. Because <laughs> it's, I mean, the, the claim is true, the notation is slightly askew. So if you write this out, what you've got is, you've got the, um, let's see here, if I say this, um, rather write this yeah I would rather write this as the sum j equals 1 to k of vj by vj transpose x that's a scalar and I guess I can write this first Let's see here. V, Vj, Vj transpose would be a what? This is a n by one, and one by n. We get n by n, right? So if I write it in that way, I can write, you know, v1, v1 transpose plus v2, v2 transpose plus da 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 plus v. Um, VK, VK transpose, all times X, right? And what I almost showed you, but again, my, I, I, I just I haven't quite crossed the I's without it, the T's just right here yet. I gotta work through coordinate mapping that I was trying to avoid. Oh well. Um, so to relate to W, what I basically am arguing is that the, the WJ, well, it's actually equal to VJ times some particular rotation matrix. All right. Now maybe that's not a rotation matrix, but I, maybe what I need there, maybe what I actually need here is something like um, something in O, something in OK with zero over here or something like that. Or, or maybe it's the identity. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure yet. But <clears throat> so what I have then with that in mind, oh, first, well, let's make these W's. See what I'm doing? W, 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 W. So suppose you started with W's. My point is, it gives you the same formula with V's. Because the W1 is like just V1R, and then you've got V1R transpose, plus da da da, plus VKR, parentheses VKR transpose. But what's, what do we know about transpose? Stock shoes, right? So this is really V1R transpose. R transpose, V1 transpose. And what does this give you? Well, this gives you, again, the same formula. Because R times R transpose is the identity. Or at least it's the identity restricted to W. Um, <clears throat> so my point is, you can argue, I'm not, I don't think, I, it's not honest to say I completely gave the argument today, but I've been giving you some indication how you can argue that despite the fact that there's apparent, an apparent coordinate dependence to our definition for projection, in fact it's just an apparent dependence, it does, it's not really there, because if you rotate to any other possible orthonormal basis, guess what, you still get the same formula for the projection, and consequently you get the same formula for the orthogonal projection as it's built from projection, right? So if the projection is independent of coordinates, so is the orthogonal projection. You guys wouldn't even notice this if I hadn't said anything, but it is a fact in linear algebra. If you give a, if you give a proof of something that's based on a specific choice of coordinates, you're obligated to show that your result does not depend on that choice of coordinates, right? So you, you guys might not have noticed it if I hadn't said anything about it, but it's actually kind of important as you go on. Sometimes you can trick yourself into thinking something works in general. 
whereas it's just really a consequence of your very specific choice of basis. Yes? Um, would you mind pointing that out one more time? The, you said if you, set up for the, like if you choose specific coordinates, you have to show that it doesn't match the result. Then uh, the result is tended to those coordinates. Well, that's what I just proved. I proved that the projection, I mean, almost proved, that the projection doesn't, it doesn't matter if you built it with a gamma basis or if you built it with a beta basis, it gives you the same formula. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. <coughs> so I need a little lemma. Lemma. The projection of x dotted with the orthogonal projection of x is equal to 0. So how would you prove this? So let's see here. What you're looking at is the projection of u of x, that product with x minus the projection w of x, right? See, so properties of the dot product that gives us the projection w of x dotted with x minus the projection w of x dotted with itself, which is what? That's the length squared, right? But Let's see here. If you put this in, if you, you know, um, so consider if um, x equals to v1 da 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 dk, right, then the projection of w of, you know, such as vj, or, or x, they want the point, is just equal to x again by the construction of the projection. So, Therefore, um, we get projection w of x dot x is just equal to x dot x, which is equal to the length of x squared. And, you know, so the above, we call this thing star. So star becomes just length of x squared minus length of x squared equal to zero. <clears throat> and on the other hand, on the other hand, right, if x is equal to vk plus one through the end, where I'm still using the same notation, right? That those are those are not in W, those are in the perp to W, right? Then what? Then the projection W of x is just equal to zero. So that, that, that can be good. If the projection is zero, then clearly the zero dot of the other thing is zero. So this proves that the projection and the orthogonal projection are perpendicular. So if you take that together with this, right, together with the fact that x is equal to projection of w plus orthogonal w of x, what's this proof about w and w perp? find W plus W per is equal to Rn, yeah, and that um, W intersect W per is equal to zero. The way I'm doing that, of course, is, um, so what's that tell me? That tells me that W direct sum of W per is what? Rn. Rn. Sorry, I'm a little bit. Excuse me, um, the reason I'm showing you this argument is not because it's the fastest argument for n. It's because this argument can be modified for inner product space. Yeah, you can you can generalize the, the, the thought of what we're doing to more general context. I, I will I will um, concede that some of the details are not quite filled out here. Let me show you a complete argument to show you that w plus w perp is Rn. 
independent of any choice of basis. Uh, oh, before I forget. You notice that this gives you a, a formula for the matrix of the projection? Like, for example, um, you can go back to last class and you could you could take the D1 and the D2, you could transpose and multiply them, you know, like like indicated there, and that would give you that would give you the matrix of the projection onto that subspace we looked at last time. It's kind of fun to do that. Oh my god. That's because each one of those gets an in binding matrix and has the in a certain element, so they all have to get let, 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 yeah. Um, let's see. What, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll actually do it. What was D1 last time? It was 1 over square root of 3, 1, 1, 1. Right. What was D2? 1 over square root of 6. What was it? Oh, yeah. I don't remember. Oh, so, 1 over square root of 6, 1, 1, negative 2. 1, 1, negative 2? OK. So then we can form the projection. So let W equal the sand of V1, V2. So the projection onto W, the matrix of that, uh, well, I could write it this way. It's X is equal to some matrix. So that matrix actually is V1, V1 transpose plus V2, V2 transpose times X. I mean, this will be the matrix for it. What, what, is, the, what is that matrix? Let's see here. It's uh, one third, right? And you got yourself. 1, 1, 1, times 1, 1, 1, plus 1, 6, because there's 1 over the square root of 6 and 1 over the square root of 6, right? So 1, 1, minus 2, 1, 1, minus 2, times x. I don't know if that's a vector, but um, let's see here. So that gives you 1 third. Let's see, this gives me 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, it's very boring. There it is, though. And uh, plus 1 sixth. Let's see here. 1, 1, minus 2, 1, 1, minus 2, one. minus 2, minus 2, 4. four. So this right here, guys, is the matrix of the projection that we talked about last time. <coughs> If you wanted something that projected just onto the span of V1, which matrix would you use? Just would it be the. Oh, I'm sorry. I need something else. Excuse me. Let me shut up. Um, <laughs> well, would it be just in, like the first part of it? You just wanted to span of V1? No. So, um, Anyway, do you guys, do you notice anything special about these matrices? Symmetric, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, they're symmetric, right? Another, another game you can play, guys, um, suppose you wanted to create a matrix which has eigenvalues, say, I don't know, you pick your eigenvalues. What, what, what eigenvalues do you guys want? 42. 42, okay. You want uh, a, with lambda equals to 42, and what else? One. Lambda equals one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, if you also say one, uh, I guess you could. Um, so what we could do is you could actually just use a is equal to basically 42. B, B1, B1 transpose plus 1 times B2, B2 transpose. Um, it's easy to see that A times B1 is equal to what? Well, when you multiply B1 with this term, it goes to 0, right? Because B1 and B2 are perpendicular. And this one leaves you 42, B1, B1 transpose, B1. This just goes to 1, which gives you 42, B1. Aha, uh -huh. I can value 42. And you can see the same thing will happen for, 
for the other one. So if you wanted to cook up matrices that have particular eigenvalues, the simple procedure you could use is pick your favorite orthonormal eigenbasis and just put weights in front of B1, B1 transpose. Now, that's only really useful, you, you can you can't, you don't like fractions, right? So nice examples, you choose eigenvalues which are like multiples of three, right? Or multiples of six. And then you'll give it'll give you integer matrices which have the eigenvalues that you want. Now you guys don't think about reverse engineering problems too much, but there's how you do it. Now there's more than this though. There's a converse to this theorem, actually. This observation, this, this thing I'm doing, is it actually works the other way around. Conversely, as we'll see, if A is equal to A transpose, then there exists an orthonormal eigenbasis. All right? This is the so-called spectral theorem. It says a little bit more than that, though. It also says that you can write A as equal to like lambda 1 times just the matrix, just the thing I'm writing, you know? Now these eigenvalues might be repeated, but part of the spectral theorem says that where um, lambda 1, lambda n are real, the eigenvalues also have to be real. That's what we're I'm working my way towards eventually proving this theorem for you, but life keeps getting in the way of it. Yes, Linda? <coughs> oh, absolutely. Oh. I think that's oh, okay. So, you notice the difference between the theorem, like here, I'm just taking an example and building it from eigenvectors, essentially, to give you certain eigenvalues. I'm telling you that, and it, it happened to be that this is a symmetric matrix, right? But I'm telling you, actually, the symmetry of the matrix is a sufficient condition to guarantee the existence of an orthonormal eigenbasis, which is really a fantastic thing. So, <clears throat> All right, let me get back on track here. You could also argue that W plus W perf, if you want a complete argument. Here's a quick argument. Why is W direct sum W perf equal to Rn? Complete argument, so here's another proof. If the span of S is equal to W and S is linearly independent, in other words, S a basis for W, then um, the null space of S taken as a matrix transpose is equal to W perfect, we discussed previously. Right? So if, let's say, gamma is basis for W perf, then we can count. So if the dimension, well, let's say the number of things in S is equal to K, what's the number of things, uh, what's the, well, what's the dimension the dimension of the null space of the perp of S, maybe the transpose. <coughs> Break nullity, right? So how do we how do we relate these two things? Because W is k-dimensional by assumption here. 
So right nullity theorem applies to the transpose, tells me the dimension of the null space of the transpose plus the dimension of the column space of the transpose is equal to what? It's equal to n. But you see, this is k. So what I have is that k plus the dimension of the null space of s is equal to n. So it follows that you know the dimension of w plus the dimension of the null space of the, you know, the basis for w transpose is equal to n. So it follows that the w plus w fur is just equal to rn. You notice this time I didn't make any use of the projection. Which is sad, because projection is actually how you calculate things, right? Projection is, is a really important idea. But this gets you to the, the thing quicker. I still need something else to show that it's direct sum. What do I need? Yeah, intersection is zero. So let's let x be an element of the intersection. What's that mean? X is an element of w. Yeah, and, and x is an element of the purpose, right? So x dot x is equal to what? It's equal to zero, right? Because x dotted with anything w is. So that implies x is equal to zero. And there you go. Rn is the direct sum of w and w perp. Now, sorry, I've spent a long time on this theorem because it's kind of the bedrock of everything else here. My apologies if it's been too long. This is actually not proved in Damano a little. He starts by stating this theorem and then saying proof left as exercise to reader. So, yeah. I mean, it's not that hard to prove, really. And, uh, like, maybe it seems harder than it is because I spent a lot of time talking about projections. But, um, equals to b, right? Where what? Where, where b is not an element of what? The column space of a, right? If b is not an element of the column space of a, it means that that has no solution, right? That was sort of our ultimate result a little bit earlier in the course about systems of equations. But now, we can go a little bit further using orthogonality and this theorem I just proved for you. In particular, we can think of the column space of A as being W, right? We can think of that as being W. And we can consider W perp as what? It's the null space of A transpose, actually, right? So for each x, we can decompose x into the projection on the w and the projection on the w perp, right? And so if you look at it, if you consider this, we have we have x is equal to the projection on the w of x plus the orthogonal projection on the w of x, right? And if you look at the length of ax minus d. Right? Well, let's see here. That's the length of A times the, the projection onto W of A. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I just I wrote this in the notes and I forgot to fix it. I'm not interested in X. I'm not interested in X. I don't want X there. What I want there is, is B. B is the problem. B is not in the column space of X. A, right? So let's think about that being B. You can do that too. So in view of that, when you look at AX minus B, you got you got yourself, you got yourself AX minus the projection onto the column space 
of B, and then minus the orthogonal piece. So if you look at this, what you really have is you call this thing, say, B1. You can call this thing, say, B2, right? And you notice that you've got B1 um, inner product with B2, with that product is like zero. So I don't know if you guys watched it or not, but I proved the Pythagorean theorem in one of those silly uh, videos I wrote for you guys. My sad, sad voice. So it was really distracting, your little kid. And then so annoying. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, 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 who are you talking to? Students. So the point is, um, if I square this, it's easier, right? And if you square it, you get what? The length of AX minus the projection times W of B squared plus the length of the orthogonal projection on the W of B squared. Now, there's nothing you can do about the second term. I mean, it is what it is. That, in some sense, is an exact measure of how far from being consistent your system of equations is, right? Like, the larger that term is, the further you are away from having an actual consistent solution to the system of equations AX equals to B. But on the flip side, if you want to get as close as you can to having a solution, what do you do? So to make the solution as close, so you just make this equal to zero to get as close as possible, right? Making this zero, making this term zero, minimizes the difference between AX and minus B. And if you actually look for a data set, that actually corresponds to minimizing the so-called, uh, the least squares. I mean, it's the difference between your data set and the model, the vertical distance, the sum of the vertical distances squared between your data set and your model. This is exactly the problem of linear least squares as you're studying like regression statistics. And so <clears throat> that's kind of awesome because what you're really trying to solve then is AX equals to the projection of W of B, right? <clears throat> but you could trade that for what? You could trade that for you could trade that for what? B minus AX B minus AX is equal to what? B minus the projection of the W of B, right? Which is what? That's the orth W of B. Which means what? B minus AX is an element of the null space of a transpose. Which is to say that a transpose times b minus ax is equal to 0, which is to say that a transpose ax is equal to a transpose b. Those, my friends, are the so-called normal equations that I had you solve earlier in this course. Solving those normal equations gets you as close as is possible to solving the inconsistent system. Precisely by what we talked about in statistics is the squares. Or here, we view it as being as close as you can to the column space in this n-dimensional context, k-dimensional subspecimen space. So, <coughs> I, um, I was kind of shocked when I first heard a person say this, because I'd seen these squares from the perspective of you know, minimizing the distance between a data set and a model, and the, the, the comment that that was the same as looking at the distance from some n-dimensional space to a k-dimensional subspace and sort of orthogonal projection. I was surprised by that, but it's exactly that. So, <clears throat> I'm going to show you something here in time remains. There's no hope for us proving the project of the spectral theorem today. I'm sorry, I'm still so behind. I'll prove what I'm saying. <coughs> I still need to talk to you about the theory of the joints on a complex complex vector space, define the adjoint for one thing, talk about what it means to self-adjoint, and then once we do that, the spectral theorem falls right out pretty fast. I have no regrets. The things I'm telling you today are important to see. So if it means that we spend a little less time on generalized eigenvectors, I think we'll survive.
I may not prove anything in chapter six. It's worth boiling down to. So sorry. Would you be okay with that? I'm asking you if you'd be okay with me not proving things in chapter six. I know the answer to that already. You're going to cry right now. As long as you don't expect to know. Well, of course I'd expect you to know them. I mean, I'm not going to know them. Exercise after reading. I might not survive. We'll see. I'm just going to keep talking. We'll see where I get to. Um, That's chapter six. What's chapter six in, in the bottom of the middle? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's what happens when there's not enough hiking vectors. I can what? I can poverty. Yes. We have to uh, call in some heavy hitters from outside the eigenspaces. So called the generalized eigenspaces. I like the part of the book where he was like, oh, shouldn't we call a characteristic polynomial an eigenpolynomial? Wouldn't that make sense? It was like but math doesn't work that way. No. It's very arbitrary. Well, I the naming of things in math is sometimes arbitrary, but not usually. Like, shockingly, an eigenbasis is what? The basis of eigenvectors. Basis of eigenvectors. And this is usually true for almost anything you can define, right? Like, to the point where sometimes you don't know what you're proving. Like, I call something the order topology, and then the proof of the, the theorem we see afterwards is theorem. Order topology is a topology, and you're like, but. Well, you see, using the words to label it is different from having proof that it actually is such a thing. <laughs> there are lots of inner products. Here's one. This you could use for like grades. Maybe the grades of the second student are worth three times as much as the grade of the first student or something like that. And so you can use a weighted inner product. But you can prove that that satisfies the same, same pattern as the, uh, you know, as a dot product or something. So you could use it for like weight, like weighted three system or something. We wouldn't do that here. We can barely understand a thousand points. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be fired at some point. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't on tape or anything, is it? Um, okay, so uh, there's also an inner product on n by, um, n, by n matrices. I, I don't know. Should this be square? I almost feel like you swear, but I say MIN here, so I'm going to trust my notes. Anyway, you take the trace of A transpose, A transpose, where is it? Here is my definition of this. Oh, it's right here. So this is essentially the trace of the product of A and B. I think it's AB transpose or something. Anyway, that gives you an inner product on the matrices. Basically, what that is, is just take the matrix and string it out as an, like a, a, a big long vector by just linking, stringing out the components. And then if you just take the sum of the squares of those as the squared length, that's what it is. So it's nothing terribly exciting. It just looks fancy. Now this is more interesting. This is more interesting. You can also talk about an inner product in function space, and the integral gives you that. So for example, the inner product of f is ng, the integral of a to b of f of x and g of x. You can prove that that has linearity and symmetry and a positive definite property you want for the inner product. And then you can do things like look at the, um, look at the span of, say, 1x and x squared. That's a three-dimensional vector space, right? And this inner product gives you like a dot product on that three-dimensional vector space. Then you can take the, the 1 and the x and the x squared, and you can normalize them. You can run Gram-Schmidt on them. And that's what I'm starting to do here. So the length of 1 is 2. That actually means the length of 1 is the square root of 2. It's the length of 1 squared. This says that the length of x squared is 2 thirds. All right? This says that the length of x squared with respect to this notion of distance on this space is, is 2 fifths, square root of 2 fifths, actually. And so <clears throat> you can calculate dot products of one function with respect to another, essentially. And you can run Gram-Schmidt. When you run Gram-Schmidt, your second and third, you end up with like this x ends up being the second thing. The third thing ends up being x squared minus 1 third. These, um, <clears throat> I think I still have to normalize at length like one. So anyway, here finally is my orthonormal, my orthonormal eigen base, uh, excuse me, orthonormal basis with respect to the standard product. 1 over square root of 2, square root of 3 over 2x, square root of 8 over 45, x squared minus 1 third. These are called Legendre polynomials, all right? And um, they have very 
interesting and important meaning in the theory of potentials in physics. If you understand the multipole expansion, for example, um, corresponding to having like four charges or more charges in particular orders, these Legendre polynomials come up with a vengeance in these infinite series expansions of these, these multipole multiples. Anyway, multipole expansion aside, you can <coughs> do things like approximate. Like here's the best approximation to the exponential in this particular like you know one x x squared. And so when I do it. <coughs> I can take inner products of the exponential with respect to this thing, and there's an approximation to the exponential just taking dot products of these functions. And this ultimately leads us to what's called Fourier analysis. See, Fourier analysis builds an orthonormal basis of functions built from sines and cosines. And what this actually corresponds to is ripping a function apart into its, its, its modes, its um, you know, essentially fundamental frequencies. This is used to, uh, to, to you know, code music, for example, um, you know, there's a, this, this, this fact that you can you can decompose music into its, its spectrum, right? It's its uh, fundamental frequencies, if you will. This corresponds to these projections as a sine and cosine. And for example, <coughs> here's one that worked out. Who cares? Details, details. This is the kind of thing we'll work out in differential equations. But it leads you to things like this. For example, this is a square wave. Well, you can't see the square wave, but the square wave would be like this. Right? And these are projections of the square wave into a space built from sums of sines and cosines using this notion of a product I was showing you. And you see as you add up more and more and more sines and cosines, you can get closer and closer and closer to the square wave. Now, to actually get there, you have to have infinitely many. So, it's not quite linear algebra, right? There's something else because you're talking about an infinite series. You need some notion of convergence. And the notion of convergence for Fourier series is rather subtle, too subtle for differential equations to really treat it. And it's past what we get to in real, so we don't really treat it here. Uh, but Swartz knows about it. You can ask him about it. He knows he's well aware of the theory of convergence for Fourier series. If you talk about it now, would you have enough to still set? Still like understand what he's talking about? I mean, you can, you can, there are books that have decent treatments of it. I can show you. But yes, I do. Um, so did you, I could be completely wrong, but did you just say that, like, the, when they, like, you listen to the oh. iPod, the way it's encoded is, like, by basis of trigonometric or something? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that MP3, I, I think music, the Fourier decomposition, or these are various twists on this, the task of Fourier decomposition. I think Fourier, Fourier decomposition is still the way to go for music. For images, there's something else called wavelets, which is based on subtracting pictures and looking at edges. And that has more to do with overall matrices, actually, and things. The, the method of compression for images and the method of compression for, for, uh, for audio is radically different. Okay. They're both, neither of those very well tailored for the other. But it's using all the stuff we learned. The JPEG stuff is based on wavelets. The MP3 is, I think, yeah, Fourier analysis, plus other stuff. But, yeah. Okay, but that's based on the basis of parametric functions. Seriously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.